Hi, everybody. I'm just so happy to be um, uh, amongst you today. I've got a voice which is kind of working and kind of not working. So I will share the full humanity of me right now in this moment with you, OK? Um, so I don't view it as necessarily obvious how to connect the figure of Beethoven that we kind of know and understand from history or that we may have been taught to kids and uh, the lives of musicians today. So I've tried to think about him uh, really as a, as a modern figure and what are the issues today and questions that I have about music that connect to what Beethoven means, at least for me, um, that might be a little bit different than it is for other people. So I've gathered five thoughts, which I'll share with you, and then we're gonna do a, a landscape uh, through the Ninth Symphony involving Ensemble Connect as well. Um, so I'll just plunge right in. First thought, um, if you take Beethoven out of the history of music, it is my contention that buildings like this and 20th century institutions would not exist. I think that what happened after Beethoven was completely inspired by him. He is integral. Carnegie Hall is not here if Beethoven didn't live. So he's unbelievably important. And at the same time, he also takes up a lot of oxygen in the room. And in that respect, if you could take Beethoven out of the contemporary world of orchestras, which is not gonna be possible, but if you could, one does wonder what other plants and what other musics might be able to grow in that space, that opened up real estate. So I would love you to think of Beethoven this year in relation to this project as a gardener rather than the biggest tree or plant in the garden, okay? Thought number one. Second thought is, just like with world religions, the, there's, a, there's a funny uh, disconnect. The size of our music institutions contrasts really sharply with the personal vulnerability of this music's message and the person himself who founded all this, okay? I want to think of him not as an iconic figure, but I want to think of him as the guy who kept getting booted out of his apartments around Vienna because of all the noise that he would make, pounding on the piano, trying to hear something that was fundamentally unhearable. So it's both moving and also very vulnerable. He lived in like 40 different apartments. He kept getting booted out. And one of the other reasons he got booted out was because he would stand in the middle of his living room, put his wash basin, and just splash like crazy. Um, and most of the spillage would go down through his floor to the roof of the landlord who lived underneath him, hence booted out of another apartment, okay? But for me, this image of a naked, soaped up Beethoven <laughs> splashing uncontrollably, this sticks with me, and I think it makes my conducting of his music better. <laughs> I think. Third thought. The same time it's vulnerable, Beethoven's music is also quite, uh, what can I say? It's, it's not just vulnerable, but it's also indestructible. How can those two things go together? I think that you can't actually perform the Ninth Symphony badly enough for it not to mean anything. And you can't necessarily say that about a lot of other composers or a lot of other kind of musics. If you take Mr. Bruckner or Mr. Haydn or Mr. Schumann or basically any new piece that's being played for the first time, you can kill these things and you can kill them pretty easily by how you choose to perform them. You guys know that. Um, Somehow you can scribble all over the Ninth Symphony. You can play it too slow, too fast. You can play it out of tune or in tune. You can cover it with graffiti, and weirdly, it actually grows in power, and I don't know what it is about that. It is undefaceable. Um, my only explanation is what we have above our head here. It's, in essence, the piece is a scribble to begin with, okay? <laughs> that is the Beethoven 9. Drink that in for a sec, all right? That's what that comes from. That's going to change the world? Hmm. All righty. <laughs> um, it's a sketch. I think it's a really admirable sketch. And it's a, maybe, maybe it's a, a rough draft waiting for three more versions or something like that, like he did with his opera overture. Every notated music is an outline of an experience that needs to be embodied. It needs to be brought to life by us. 
um, this is one. It's like an architectural drawing of a very strange building that's going to stand for a long time, but that doesn't have a specific vision of what color the cinder block walls are or where the lights are hanging, um, which I think is why it's appropriated so often for such wildly different purposes. You can kind of do the details of Beethoven 9 as you like. But Beethoven's music, thought number four, inspires revolutionary, world-embracing thinking at the personal level. Um, even though it is a privilege that I think we may have, but that many, many people in this world do not have, in essence, this music's message is, I don't want to be the composer or person that you expect me to be. I will be who I am, who I want, and I will do so without trampling on your right to do the same. In fact, I encourage you to be different than me. Even though I'm just one little person, I know that me, this is Beethoven speaking, being the full me is a world-changing power. And I'm thought of Beethoven when, these days, when I look at little Greta Thunberg. She's a Beethoven for our age. Beethoven is a paradigm of radical authenticity and radical inclusion. This music says, in essence, the same thing that I saw on a banner outside a church in, in Melbourne or a picture of it. That message is, at the end of the day, I'd rather be excluded for who I include than to be included for who I exclude. That's Beethoven, okay? And this is a fundamental question for our time. Fifth thought. As such, the ninth works better as a protest anthem than as a celebratory back padding gala. Woohoo! Joy. We all think of it as joy, 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 since that's what comes last in the piece. But in the overall balance of the piece, the not joyous is almost dominant. It's better at describing how the world is not yet than, and how it might be than confirming how the world actually is. Although some of the more horrid aspects of the first two movements do remind me more of our times now than I would like. Um, I want to share with you one of the most helpful sentences that I ever came across in music, and I think it, that you could even think of music this way was, was, uh, um, was important for me. So the old German conductor, Furtwängler, is just reading along in German, and all of a sudden he says at one point this thing. He says, Bach's music is. Bach's music is being. The German word is sein. Sein. Mozart's music, he says, uh, happens. That's the word, German word, geschehen. Beethoven's music becomes. Beethoven's music is werden. And that very word is in Schiller's text. Alle Menschen werden Brüder. And when I hear that, I think they aren't brothers to start with. They become brothers by undergoing discovery and danger and transformation. And that's what Beethoven's notes do. They become. So to the ninth itself, every movement of the ninth starts in the middle of something. Latin, in media res. You're grabbing part of a picture which has already begun. He'd done this in a bunch of his previous symphonies, but this one takes it to a totally new level. The first movement, it gathers pieces of itself from really far away, and it's, for me, it sounds like the Big Bang accelerating in reverse, okay? I would love to hear that with Ensemble Connect right now.
Big Bang in reverse. What would it sound like if it was actually the Big Bang, not in reverse? kind of weird that we only read notes in one direction, right? So to, I just asked them an hour ago, let's read them the opposite direction. It kind of works. Um, uh, great. Um, the second movement uh, raises questions for me as a conductor that are really vital that many of you may have confronted. So it's all in one. It's a scherzo in one. So I could conduct it like this the whole time. But the phrases are almost all four bar phrases. So we assume, okay, so I'm going to be four four. The, the four bars are going fast. Okay, but then I have a choice, like where do I actually put the one? So I had an epiphany, and I just wanted to share the results of that epiphany with you. I'm going to conduct this the way I used to conduct it, and the way I think most of my colleagues conduct it and think of this music first. Okay, a little excerpt from the second movement, just about where's the one? So my epiphany was, there was something about dukeru, 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 this little kicky gesture on all my ones that I was like, always made me feel a little uncomfortable, like I wasn't looking forward to conducting the second movement. How can I decide to do something that makes me look forward to doing this music more? It's not the music's fault, it's my fault. Um, and I figured out that if I actually start with a silent one of that four bar phrase, one, it gives me an opportunity to actually give an impulse before the bukkaras happens, and suddenly I felt involved again in the music in a different kind of way. I want you to hear, maybe it feels a little different for them. I think we discovered at the rehearsal it does. I'm going to beat my new version of it, see if it sounds any different. This is the cool thing about the piece. I don't know if it's better, but it makes me love it more, the act of conducting, so that can't make it worse, at least, um, uh, at least for now. Great. We can't always assume that the first thing we hear is necessarily the beginning. It may just be the first thing that comes into view, um, uh, but not where it actually started. 
The mountain is there long before we open the curtain to see it. And I love thinking of music that way as well. One of the cool things about the trio section in the middle of this movement um, is that it has the actual uh, shape and notes of the Ode to Joy kind of embedded in it, but it's in a real rustic kind of village version and, and only does so if you don't take the beginning as the beginning. But I'm going to ask the winds to play it now. You'll hear it once, you won't hear the Ode to Joy, then we're going to slow it down and maybe you will, okay? Two times the, uh, the, the, the trio section. would have thought that before. Um, so when this appears in the fourth movement, it sounds new, but it also reminds us weirdly, of, vaguely of something, um, and its path has actually been prepared. The newness has a history. Third movement is a huge stasis on B flat, which takes the D that the timpani and the trumpets and the horns have been banging into our skulls over and over again for the first two movements, and suddenly that D is underpinned gently, not with a godlike power that descends from on high, but with an earthy, lower power of B flat. This is my version of what that actually sounds like. It goes on to be a music that is mixed in character, but in which there is definitely a kind of spirituality and also a kind of give, giving up, I would say. Um, maybe it's uh, don't look above the clouds for the loving father, which is in the text that comes after this, but find God emanating just beneath your feet. You've been standing on him the whole time, unbeknownst. The movement also contains a lot of referential quotes to uh, Floristan's aria, should you know this, from, uh, from Fidelio. And the words of that are, oh my God, what darkness I stand in. And then he keeps saying this thing over and over again, which is, mein Pflicht hab ich getan. I have done my duty. I have done my best. And in a way, and this is where it's brought me. It's kind of a giving up uh, gesture. I just want you to hear that little credential gesture as it shows up in this movement.
simple notes with a lot of meaning. So these things are all great, but really honestly, the first thing that grabbed me about this music as a kid was dealing with the especially strange shape and ugly sound of the opening of the last movement. I didn't quite know what to do that, with that. Let's listen to it. leaving that hanging. Um, it fits and starts in a cello bass line that seems to be saying something in some language, but the supertitles are turned off, like the parents on Charlie Brown. Um, it has little snippets then of earlier movements that appear and seem to get considered, digested, and then left by the wayside. So somehow, for Beethoven, none of those turn into the last movement. Um, so, epiphany alert. The little me listens to this and says to himself, I get it, he's writing a piece about the process of writing a piece. He's showing us his actual thinking. And this made me very, very happy because I'd actually tried that same technique on a few of my required papers for ninth grade English class <laughs> when I couldn't think of a topic. It's like, I know, I'll let the process be the product. And I said cleverly, and I, I thought I'd gotten away with something when my teacher didn't seem to notice that I actually had no thesis. I was just saying something about the reality, the crushing reality of not being able to think of anything new to say. And, um, and I, still, I still did pretty well on my papers. Um, so finally, though, and almost grudgingly, comes this idea that we're very familiar with. I'm just going to ask these guys to play it. trying to get you to dislike it. I just want to honestly say that if, if he hadn't written the symphony after that, you would listen to that and you'd go like, Beethoven? 
great composer? Well, maybe, maybe not. And weirdly, it's bottom heavy. The second half of it, he just repeats exactly again. Um, first rule of rhetoric and interviews. When you're not sure what you're gonna say, repeat the last thing you said or heard to give yourself more time to think of something, right? I had a hilarious encounter with Jesse Norman. I'd asked her to sing a concert with us at the Yale Symphony. And she had said, first said yes and then had to say no because uh, she was being paid a bajillion dollars to do a recital in the same city, New Haven, where I was conducting. So I went to greet her at that concert and I said, you might remember me, Miss Norman. I was in the, in the Leipzig Gewand House. And she goes, the Leipzig Gewand House. <laughs> and I said, yes, we collaborated on the four last songs. The four last songs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, <laughs> and then she said, and I said, well, I said, I'm so sorry you couldn't come to sing with us. And she says, perhaps another season. <laughs> But that method, that was technique. That's green room technique if you need that. Just repeat the last thing that anybody said to you and it, you think you're even having a conversation. It's great. <laughs> so I learned from Jesse. Um, uh, so this tune obviously gathers a lot of steam, which we know. Um, and its, its success is due mostly to the creativity of how it's accompanied, not the, not the melody itself. And then it runs smack dab into the same wall of uncertainty and self-critique and stinging doubts that we actually started from. Then, for me, that's the sound of frustrated, no, manuscript paper being crumpled up and tossed in the fire, a little bit like The Shining. Um, uh, va round, vehement rejection. And then finally, a voice that is not on mute enters. We've discovered that one of our Ensemble Connect people actually has a voice, so he's learned this this last hour. This is Brian telling us, speaking to us in Beethoven's voice. Good job, Brian. Okay, here's my naughty translation of Beethoven's words. He's saying basically, okay, despite my hopes, this is going nowhere. I have to accept that this symphony has to become something different. I don't know what. It might be an oratorio or a symphony with vo voices, whatever you want to call it, but it has to come out of the closet reveal itself, and it has to make me happier in the act of writing it. If it's a thrill for me to improvise and write, it'll be a thrill for other people to hear. And if not, fuck them. <laughs> and I believe that's a pretty literal translation from the German. <laughs> so despite all the joy blazing hoopla of this last movement that, that ensues once the chorus and the singers and everybody gets going, um, the favorite moment for me by far um, is when Beethoven shows the underpinning of doubt, a 
uh, that's there with all of this joy. He lets a kind of force of depression seep back into this last movement and make itself known. Horns are repeating in octaves left by their lonesome. I actually played this when I was in Leipzig at the age of 22, is the only American in the country. It was my first concert there, and suddenly this came alive for me, that sense of lone, lonesomeness. What it sounded to me right after that is a kind of mighty personal act of will. And in one two-bar crescendo, those notes seem to say, no, I will not sink, I will not. I will be joyous. Just, I want to share with you personally that my dad, who passed away just uh, this past year, suffered from dementia. In the last few months of his life, um, conversation had long stopped being possible. Um, I shared with him one day a uh, recording of a performance I did in Barcelona of the Beethoven Nine. And not being able to have any conversation, he started mouthing the words and singing the Ode to Joy. So um, this was his last grasp. He was not going to sink, but he was going to go out with these words uh, in his mind. So I'm going to ask you guys if you can help by singing this tune with us, literally in whatever language you'd like, solfege, scat, German, <laughs> Methodist hymn version, whatever. <laughs> Please just join us. And we're going to do that second half twice since we made fun of that. Um, so so let's, let's go ahead. Um, and you'll hear when to come in, OK? just for my own little coda, that leaves me with the question, can we make joy happen? Can we force it? Uh, and is it doubt that makes at least some joys possible? For me, the Beethoven I know and that I think we're honoring here at Carnegie Hall is the one who brought the become and becoming into music in the most human of ways. That's, that's the Beethoven we're celebrating, not a statue or a bigger than life figure who wrote nothing but iconic masterworks. It's not the way his life was. I go instead for the man who made accepting your weaknesses and doubts and being unafraid to show uh, your scars. That's the greatest power in music. Invest in your failures, your brokenness. Don't hide them, flaunt them, live them. They may just be a world changing force on the far side of your struggle. And I'm hoping that that's what you might be able to encourage your kids and students and songwriters to do. And I look forward working together with you on those all together in April. Thank you. Thank you.